Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'll try to be brief and quick. <laughs> so we'll talk about the long-term care of renal transplant patient. So these are some of the things. Uh, we already had uh, talks about rejection, so I won't talk about rejection. These are more of the medical complications that you see in a renal transplant patient long-term. So we'll talk about new onset diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, infection, malignancy, gout, bone disease, and post-transplant erythrocytosis, and cardiovascular complications, like one slide each. Okay, so new onset diabetes, we have all seen them in the clinic. Post-transplant, 20 to 30% of them can have new onset diabetes. The risk factors are the older you are, family history, uh, hepatitis C infection, being obese, and immunosuppression also plays a role in new onset diabetes. So uh, glucose uh, corticoids, your steroids, they impair both your hepatic and extrahepatic action of insulin, and they also cause post-receptor insulin resistance. And cyclosporin and prograf also they call, are, have reversible toxicity to the islet cells, and they also directly affect the transcriptional regulation of insulin expression. So immunosuppression also contributes to new onset diabetes. So diagnosis is the same as a non-transplant patient. And again, when to check the fasting blood glucose. Th these are for people who are not diabetic. So we are really trying to diagnose new onset diabetes. So it should be measured weekly for the first four weeks post-transplant, and then three and six months, and then yearly. But this is not for someone who's established diabetic. The hemoglobin A1C can be checked after three months post-transplant. And again, prevention is important and which is individualization of immunosuppression and lifestyle changes. The treatment, again, is very similar to non-transplant patients. As you can see, diabetes is defined as uh, the fasting glucose more than 126 and a 2R more than 200. And you should always concentrate on lifestyle and education. Not that it's uh, ever very successful, but you try. Uh, then monotherapy, and if that doesn't work, combination or oral therapy. Otherwise, the patient goes to insulin and oral therapy. So these are, there are many oral agents which are available now. So you can use sulfonylureas, meglitinides, bigonides, TZDs, and the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. And uh, they all have different advantages and disadvantages. So you have a lot to choose from. So lipid abnormality is also very prevalent in different series from 16 to 78% of the patients have it. So primarily, you can have high LDL, low HDL, hypercholesterolemia. So steroids uh, basically stimulate your uh, VLDL, your very low-density lipoprotein, and there is down-regulation of LDL receptors. Tacrolimus and uh, cyclosporin both can also cause hyperlipidemia. Rapamycin uh, can cause hypertriglycidemia by blocking your uh, lipoprotein lipase. So someone on serolimus or rapamycin with high triglycerides may be related to that. So in the initial fasting lipid panel, you should do total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. And if you have initiated therapy, then the second measurement should be four to 12 weeks later. And repeat measurements can be done every three to 12 months. So treatment again, uh, you can dietary modification, weight reduction, um, immunosuppression change. Uh, the HMG co is co is, uh, CoA reductase inhibitors, your statins, they are more likely to induce rhabdomyolysis with cyclosporin. Pravastatin and fluvastatin, they have less adverse effects and interactions. The only randomized trial in transplant patients has been the ALERT trial which had almost 2,000 renal transplant recipients with a total cholesterol of 154 to 347. And they were either given fluvastatin or placebo. The mean follow-up was five years. So LDL did decrease in the statin group by 32%. And there were fewer cardiac deaths or non-fatal MIs that were observed in the fluvastatin group. So again, as you know, the ACC came up with general guidelines for hyperlipidemia in general population, uh, which are as follows. Your clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or if your LDL is more than 190, or diabetics with LDL between 70 to 189. 
So these are the ones for general population. Cadigo also came up with their clinical practice guidelines for lipid management. They actually recommend treatment with statins in all adult kidney transplant recipients, especially above 30 years of age. And for triglycerides, they recommend lifestyle change. Above that, you can do diet and azotemib, which is Zetia. Nicotinic acid, which is used in general population, is not advised in advanced CKD. So the next part that you see in a lot of transplant patients is hypertension. It's very prevalent. It may be related to uh, the kidney not working very well or the high renin state. Immunosuppression also contributes to it. But always remember renal artery stenosis because that is a correctable form of hypertension. So uh, we have to have a high index of suspicion for it. The arrow shows where the stenosis is. So blood pressure management in the first post-transplant year, uh, again, you can check uh, if they have proteinuria. If they have proteinuria, then ACE inhibitors and ARBs are, should be considered. But otherwise, all patients with lifestyle modifications first, and then depending on the stage of hypertension, uh, you can do combinations. And if, uh, if these are not at goal, then you optimize those, or you add a new drug, or you look for other causes. Again, the next thing is infection, and I think it was mentioned before as well. Early on in the first month is the surgical infections and related to donor-related infections. Then it's more of opportunistic infections, but later on, past in the long term, these are more community-acquired or persistent infections. Some of the opportunistic infections, CMV was an important one before we had Valcite. But others that you have seen on the floors when you manage these patients, this is a patient with the zoster, herpes zoster, or varicella. So you can have primary infection, and you can also have reactivation. So you can see the rash, vesicular rash, dermatomal. Herpes simplex, you can have ulcerative or vesicular rash there. You can, uh, this is another viral-related disease, Kaposi sarcoma, HHV8. You can see those purple plaques. Among the bacterial infections, you see a lot of UTIs, which are very common, prevalent in the first year post-transplant. The pathogens are similar to the general population, E. coli, enterococcus, pseudomonas. And it's related to both the trauma during surgery, but other things like neurogenic bladder, anatomic abnormalities, if they have a stent. Another important complication over time is malignancies associated with transplant, and there are many risk factors being immunosuppression, viral infections, smoking, but viruses also play a very important role, like lymphomas are associated with EBV, cervical cancer with HPV, and you have non-melanotic skin cancers with HPV. Certain cancers are, uh, the observed to expected ratio in transplant patients is extremely high, like Kaposi's, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or skin cancers. And as you can see, the kidney cancers are also much more as compared to non-transplant. So carcinoma in skin and lips, these are just looking at squamous cell carcinoma. In transplant patients, they can be younger and still have it. They can have multiple lesions and uh, involvement. So you should always look at the skin and mucosa. Lymphomas or PTLD, we are post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. It's generally B-cell in origin, and from hyperplasia, it can turn to neoplasia. Renal cell cancer, again, we see 24% uh, are discovered incidentally, and the predisposing uh, causes most of the times we see is an acquired cystic kidney disease uh, by, from while they were on dialysis. Other metabolic problems, you, you can see joint diseases with gout. We all have seen these patients with transplant. There is a high prevalence of hyperuricemia in this patient population also. So that's very high, and some of them will get gout too. And the treatment, again, is prednisone, avoid non-steroidals. And again, remember, you should not combine allopurinol with azathioprine, although we see very few patients now with imiran because allopurinol inhibits uh, xanthine oxidase, and that's the primary enzyme responsible for inactivating 6-mercaptopurin. So if you combine that, it can cause bone marrow suppression. So bone disease, again, it's multifactorial. It's because of uh, hyperparathyroidism that is persistent prior on dialysis, steroid use, age-related. 
and risk of fractures is high as compared to non-transplant population. And for surveillance, you can look at the vitamin D levels, PTH, and DEXA scans, and you try to correct the cause if possible. And osteopenia is very prevalent. It's a higher risk for pathological fractures, and the prevalence of uh, fractures in kidney transplant may be as high as 22%, with vertebrae and the ribs uh, involvement can also be higher. So the bone loss occurs early and rapidly post-kidney transplant. In the first year, it could be 1.6% per month in the first five months. But then as the steroids and everything comes low, it could be 1.7% per year. But again, as we all know, we don't have a lot of medications that are available. Cardiovascular complications, just remember that these patients, even if they are young, CKD end stage uh, is an independent risk factor. And as you can see, as compared to general population, which are your squares, and this is a transplant patient, still have a higher uh, cardiovascular mortality. The cumulative incidence of ischemic heart disease and uh, strokes and peripheral vascular disease is high in these patients. So be aware and look for those things. Post-transplant erythrocytosis, we all have seen those in clinic, the ones uh, we have some patients in the clinic. So hematocrit, more than 51% on two or more consecutive determinations. Generally, you see it early on in the first two years. And uh, the etiology is generally, uh, it, some people think it is excess EPO release from the in native kidney, and some feel there is enhanced sensitivity to EPO and activation of the angiotensin II receptor. So uh, generally for them, you have seen that we do phlebotomies, give them ASARB inhibitors. The last slide uh, is just anemia, that's the opposite end. So you see a post-transplantation anemia. So make sure you check for iron deficiency, malignancies, erythropoietin deficiency. It could be an inflammatory state. Infections like Parvo B19, we have seen some of those as well. And immunosuppression. ACE inhibitors, serolimus, MMF, all can also cause post-transplant anemia. Thank you. I hope I was brief. Do you have any questions? Don't get your mic. Renal artery stenosis. Is there a point in time where you no longer suspect it in a hypertension patient, or can it happen at any point post-transplant? It can happen at any point post-transplant. There are different etiologies for renal artery stenosis. So the early ones are more related to surgical technique. But later on, even atherosclerotic uh, factors can lead to renal artery stenosis. And sometimes you see it not in the renal artery, but in the iliac vessels. Thank you.